<laughs> Folks, welcome. I'd like to uh, uh, extend my appreciation for your attendance in another Washington County Public Affairs Forum. We've got Matt from the Oregon Wave Energy Trust. Joseph, would you uh, turn the volume up just a little bit? Can you hear me a little bit better now? Let's take that down a bit. Um, Matt from Oregon Wave Energy Trust is our speaker, and he'll go on in just a little bit. I'd like to uh, remind you that, uh, as I said last week, uh, our servers uh, are not adding a gratuity, and that I'd ask that if they do uh, provide you with good service, that you add um, uh, a gratuity to uh, um, your, uh, your check, just because I think I've seen behind the scenes while they're setting up, and they are working really hard. Uh, I'd also like to um, uh, say that uh, if you have not renewed your membership, we've got uh, forms over there on the back table, and it would be great if you could do that, although I'm really pleased with the number of people who already have done that. I think the forum is uh, setting a, a tone for continuing for many years to come for the renewals that we've just had. That being said, I'd ask that you put your hands together as I introduce Matt from Oregon Wave Energy Trust. Thank you. Thank you all for having me here today to this uh, public forum. It's uh, very nice to be here and happy to tell you all about Wave Energy and what we're doing here in Oregon to help bring the industry to the state and help establish Oregon as a leader in Wave Energy. Now, just a quick show of hands. Is anybody familiar with Wave Energy and what's been happening in Oregon over the past several years? A few people. Good. It's been in the news a little bit here and there, so it's good to know. We'll give you the full presentation today. So real quick, I'm just going to do a really quick run through of what we're doing. I'll dive a little deeper into it here in just a second. But essentially we're looking to bring these technologies like we have here. We're looking to put them in the ocean like that. We're looking to create electricity from those uh, devices. We're looking to save places like this, create a bunch of these jobs, not have as many places like this. And that's essentially it. I appreciate your time. I'll be heading home. <laughs> Taking a little deeper dive into it. I'll start with, I'll start real generally with what the Oregon Wave Energy Trust is. You might hear me refer to it as OWET during this presentation. Um, so if I say OWET, I mean the Oregon Wave Energy Trust. Uh, we are a nonprofit public private partnership uh, funded primarily by the state of Oregon. We have started to receive funding from some, uh, some private partnering that we've been doing with other organizations such as Oregon State and the Northwest National Marine Renewable Energy Center, which I'll get into more later. Um, but we're primarily funded by the state to establish an industry around wave energy here in Oregon. It was decided by the state legislature in 2007 to establish OET, and I'll get into that a little bit more as we go as well. Our mission is to support the responsible development of wave energy in Oregon. And I might also say ocean energy today too because we're expanding beyond just waves. We're starting to see offshore wind as an industry that might set up here in Oregon as well. But when I say responsible development, yes, we're advocates for the industry. We want to see it come to Oregon, but we only want to see it in Oregon if it's going to fit into the Oregon way. If it doesn't affect, uh, if it doesn't take away from any other communities or uh, it's not wanted by the public, then we're, we're looking to responsibly develop this. We're including all stakeholders in the process as we're working to grow this industry here in Oregon. And our vision is to create, I have to read this off the screen, I apologize, to create and attract an ocean energy industry in Oregon that leads to significant addition to the state's economy, creating family wage jobs, and increasing our per capita income. This is an economic driver. We, we see it as an economic driver. We have hopes that this is an industry that can establish itself in Oregon, can be a leader. We can export our technologies and our, and our expertise beyond our state and bring business back in. The focus of our organization, we have uh, several different departments that we work out of. First is external affairs. This is an example today, as an example of our external affairs. We do uh, community outreach and education, letting people know about wave energy so you can make your own decisions when those times come up. Uh, we fund research and development projects so we can understand how this uh, technology is going to affect the environment that it's sitting in. This is a, a source of renewable energy. It does uh, sit in a natural place, so we want to make sure we're not going to be killing too many fish or seals or whales, um, that we're not affecting the tides and the waves and the sediment. So we funded a lot of research, and you'll see a page right after this on some of those projects. We work in the regulatory and policy um, arenas as well. Um, I, the executive director, my boss, Jason Bush, um, tends to focus on this effort a little bit more, but he spends a lot of time in Salem. 
It's been to DC a lot recently as well, so we're, we're advocating for uh, policies and laws that'll help us put projects in the ocean in a responsible manner, like I mentioned earlier. And lastly is utility markets. We've uh, been working with utilities, everyone from PGE to coastal PUDs, because ultimately they're the people who are going to be buying the electricity that we're making from these devices. They're our customer. We need to ensure that what we're doing fits into their long-term plans. Like I mentioned, we uh, just a quick example of some of the environmental studies we've done, baseline characterizations of benthic habitat. So we've gone out to some of the projected um, deployment sites, project sites, and we've, we did a study on uh, the crabs. How many crabs are there? What are their movements? Where do, they, uh, where do they go? What are the genetic diversities in these species of crab? So we know once we start putting projects out there, we have some baseline data. We can go back and we can say, we can, have, we can see clearly the effect that these devices have had. I'm not going to read all these to you. I'll highlight a couple um, as well. The marine mammal study, people are always really interested in how this affects whales and seals. So we've, we've helped to uh, um, fund some projects that have studied the migration paths of, of gray whales as they're on their way to Alaska. Um, we worked uh, seal habitats. So we're not, whales typically will swim in the same width of area every year when they're passing along Oregon. So with that information, we know that that's probably not the best place to go put a, a wave energy device with, with some cables and moorings and electricity running down the ground. So we've done our best to minimize impacts. And that's the real goal of our, of our R&D programs, to help minimize impacts down the line once we start seeing actual projects going in the water. This is renewable energy. This slide tells you essentially why we want renewable energy. Um, Believe what you want about climate change, that's your opinion, that's your thought, but the truth is, is we have a, a amounts, immense amount of energy in our environment that we can extract and we're, we're learning how to do it more efficiently and uh, how to bring those costs down without polluting the environment. So this is a new form of, of uh, renewable energy that we're hoping, or we know has a lot of potential and we're hoping that we can bring it to a scale like you see wind and solar these days. We like to say wave energy is where wind was about 20 years ago. So. We have a little ways to go. Hopefully it's not going to take us 20 years to get there. We're learning a lot from those industries that have come before us, but we still have a little way to go. We're R&D. We're moving forward. This is more complicated than you need to see, but this is essentially a, a, a graph going into the future of what our energy demands are going to be worldwide. The green is worldwide. It fairly correlates to um, the, the different labels that they have on there. But as you can see, we're, we're, we're continuing to need more energy. We charge our cell phones, we charge our cars now, we, charge, we have our bigger TVs that use more power. Our refrigerators use less, which is great, but hopefully uh, we're plugging more and more things in. So we need more sources of energy. There's no question about that. Where that comes from, whether it be from coal, from natural gas, from renewables, that, will, that is yet to be determined. But there's no debate in this graph right here. So why wave energy? Why, what, what makes wave energy so great and, and better? We don't want to say better. Why? What makes it such a potential source? It's plentiful. The ocean has, uh, if we could extract all of the energy from all of the oceans around the world, we would have 30 times the energy that we need as a society. There's no question about it. That's not practical. It's not going to happen. We wouldn't be able to do that. But even extracting a small amount can help meet our energy needs. Water is 784 times more dense than air. Essentially what that means is you can extract a lot more energy out of the ocean than you can from wind. Wind has a certain amount of energy flowing through it. A wave has a certain amount of energy. Being more dense, you can extract. That's the simple definition of there. Uh, waves are reliable and they're predictable. We know 72 hours out almost exactly the wave climate that'll be coming through any certain area. Uh, we're funding projects to really pin that down but much more predictable than wind and than solar. Solar, you can have clouds come over. Wind, you get the gusts and, and the steady winds are hard to determine. But knowing 72 hours out, everywhere from 72 to within 10 minute forecasts, really allows utilities to plan for their energy. They're all buying energy to sell to us. So knowing what is available and how they can predict that days and even minutes out is very helpful to them. Uh, and then we have inexhaustible coastal populations. I think over 50% of the world's population lives within a mile of a coast. This is an opportunity to provide a new clean source of energy for those populations. And lastly, because we need it, like I said, for all those different reasons, is growing energy demands. A quick bit about Oregon. 
Uh, we have the best wave resource in the continental United States. You'll see a little bit better in Alaska, southeast Alaska. Once you get further north, you get ice, so we can't do wave energy up there. Um, but we have uh, the best wave resource in the, sub, in the continental US. Uh, our coastal infrastructure, which was built to supply the timber industry, um, has a lot of power lines, a lot of substations, and has a lot of capacity for power. Unfortunately, a lot of those mills have closed down over the years, which leaves openness in the grid infrastructure out there. So we could add up to 430 megawatts of power, which is quite a lot. That's powering almost 40,000 homes without any major upgrades in our infrastructure on the coast. It's a big selling point. That's what sets us apart from Washington and California's coast as well. Uh, we have research institutions. We have uh, an experienced and established supply chain. We have um, workforce and our commitment to sustainability and, and renewable energy in Oregon is, 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 a, is a big asset for us and we think we can get a lot of willpower to help support this. Quick history of wave energy in Oregon. In 2004 there was a report put out by the Electric Power Research Institute saying that Oregon has, I'll, I'll summarize it, has a ton of energy that we can extract from our ocean. So after that, you started seeing some companies, some early stage wave energy companies coming in with interest. So the first preliminary permit with the Federal Energy Regulatory Committee in 2006. Um, and then you saw several more from that point. There was almost a, we call it a, we don't want to say a landmass, but um, a rush of people who were wanting to establish and put projects in the ocean. At that point, the state said, well, hold on, we need to really examine this and make sure we're not laying you on top of the best fishing grounds and the best recreation areas. We don't want projects, you know, obstructing our coastline. So in 2007, they helped form the Oregon Wave Energy Trust, which my organization I work for. And in 2008, began the process of the Territorial Sea planning process. And this essentially was, uh, Oregon's Territorial Sea goes from the coast, from the beach, three miles offshore. How are we going to use this area? Can we set aside priority areas for ocean energy development for fishing, for recreation, for marine reserves. Uh, and that process lasted five years and actually just wrapped up. Um, January, I think, was, was finally finished. And that helped us to identify, now we have four sites that will move forward, hopefully see movement forward with ocean energy, wave energy projects um, moving forward there. Uh, I'll skip this slide. There's wave energy, well, essentially there's wave energy and there's tidal energy, so don't, don't confuse this with tidal. Um, tidal is a, essentially an ocean river moving in and out of certain areas every day. We have tides in Oregon. We don't have a great tidal resource for energy. Um, the Puget Sound is a better example of where you'd see more tidal energy because you can focus. You focus that energy in between an island or a landmass, and that's where you can really, you know, you put your devices right there. Oregon, we have the wave resource. So that's what we focus on down here. <clears throat> Now we'll, we'll get into kind of the, the fun part, I think, is looking at what these technologies are and how they work. I, I heard about wave energy in high school, but I never really understood what it meant. You know, how do you extract energy from the waves? So here we'll see some pictures of different devices, and I'll, I'll give you my non-engineer perspective on how they work. So I'm not too technical, but I kind of understand. We have here, this is an overtopping device. So essentially this would be built on the shore or on a breakwater or a jetty, something like that. Water will come over a ledge and then fall down through this tube, which has a turbine in it, and the turbine in there will spin, energy gets made. Um, similar idea here, this is on a jetty or breakwater as well, except this takes the pressure of the waves coming in and forces air up through a turbine as the wave fills that chamber. As the water leaves the chamber, the air will come back down through the chamber and you have a bi-directional turbine in there that'll essentially catch, catch energy both ways. Um, this is an attenuator. It's, it's pretty self-explanatory from the picture here. I'll show you a real life picture of one of these here in a few minutes. Um, but essentially hydraulic rams inside there that are getting pressed and, and released each time the waves come by. This is a heaving buoy or a point absorber. This is a, the more popular technology that you might have seen and or read about in the news. Couple more. Um, this one would sit, like you say, on the sea floor and essentially just flap back and forth with the waves. And then this one over here, the rotating mast. This works in the same way that you have a, a, if you have a watch that has a self winder on it. Essentially, there's just a, like like the picture shows a weighted piece in there that spins as the waves are coming through. And lastly, there's the submerged pressure differential. Um, sits on the bottom of the ocean, completely out of sight. The pressure of the waves is, is essentially just pressing 
and releasing on on, on this, and there's different ways of, of building it to, to extract the mushroom. Ocean Power Technologies is a, um, a company that is out of New Jersey. They've been in Oregon for quite some time. They actually filed that first preliminary permit. Um, this is a device that was built here in Portland, built by Oregon Ironworks, and now stationed at Vigor Marine, which is on Swan Island, right in downtown on the Willamette River. Um, for scale, if you can see, and there's a few better scale, there's a person right here. These are big devices. This, I like to relate them to windmills. When, have you ever been driving down I-84 and you see those big turbines driving down the road in the summertime? They're massive, and these are things that are going to be far offshore, hard to see from shore. You might be able to see them. Please, question. Where's the person? Over here on the right. You can see the red dot? On the top by the yellow there. Yeah. So I think the, the base of this thing here is almost 30 feet in diameter. I think the total length of this is approximately about 100 feet, 150 feet. So this buoy essentially works. I think we have a better picture coming up here. This is, yes. This is what it would look like um, from the surface if you were sitting in a boat next to it. Most of that, are, most of that is underwater. But essentially, what we have, this is this piece here, the spar hole, is fairly static in the water. It does have a little movement. But there's a float. This is a float on top. And as the waves come by, it moves up and down with the waves. And then you have inside, there's, there's uh, magnets in here. And then the pole's wrapped with copper wire. And when you pass the copper wire over a magnet, that's how you get electricity. That's how all the turbines that we have work. This is just a new way to do it. But as you can see, this is another good example. I like this slide because it shows you the footprint of a device. It's more than just this. It's more than what you can see here. It has mooring lines that will extend far out, and if you're in 150, 200 feet of water, which some of these devices are intended to be, those mooring lines are going to expand quite a ways. I don't have a number exactly, but it takes up quite a footprint for a device like that. This is a device called the Aquamarine Oyster. This is a Scottish technology. Um, again, for scale, quite large. And also for scale, this is a, a rated at almost a megawatt of power that would come out of this device. A megawatt's enough to power almost 1,000 homes roughly, depending on the size of the home and things like that. Um, this device has been deployed in Scotland, several, a um, couple different deployments actually, I have some pictures. As you can see from the air, this is what the device would look like. This is in the Orkney Islands off the north coast of Scotland. Um, so that's what it looked look like there. And I actually was lucky enough to get to go to Orkney several months ago and got this beautiful day on the water. It's, it's never nice in Orkney. It's always rainy and windy, kind of like Oregon. They say it's worse. Uh, but we had a beautiful day, we got to go out to sea, we got to be within touching distance of this device, which never would happen um, with, with the weather that they normally have. But as that looked like, it's an oyster, so it opens and closes with the waves, and it actually pumps pressure, pressurized water system to an onshore substation here. So there's underground pipes from this device all the way in and then back out. It's a loop system. This is The advantage of this is you have your onshore generation, so you don't need to go to sea. To, um, to do O&M operations maintenance on your generator. So it solves a lot of problems there. It also creates a lot of problems. Who's had a problem with a pipe in their house? <laughs> try doing it, try putting a pipe 15 feet under the surface of the ocean in these harsh conditions. So it, there's, there's issues on each end there, but. Uh, this is one of those uh, predator, um, uh, oscillating water columns where the air pushes the tube. This is actually in Portugal. You can see down here at the bottom of the, the slide here, um, that's a, it was built onto a harbor, you know, a jetty outside of a harbor. This is in Portugal. This is the, actually the only active wave energy project in the world, um, utility connected wave energy project. There's research projects, there's test centers. This is the only one that's fully functional. It creates about uh, a small amount of power for a small village in Portugal. Um, this is a great technology. Problem is, is they need to be built into the, the jetties and uh, with the Army Corps of Engineers owns the jetties, and it, it creates a lot of problems when you try and say, let's put something there. They'd rather wait till they need to be rebuilt, and then we have the conversations on, well, let's put something that'll take some of the energy away from the waves, create some electricity all at the same time. This is a company called Columbia Power Technologies. This is one of our uh, shining examples of an Oregon-based company who is doing great things in wave energy. They started um, some graduates from... Uh, Oregon State did some master's work, decided that this was a good idea, they formed a company, and now they have a device 
Uh, it's called the Sea Ray. And this is an earlier version of it. This is from a deployment actually in the Puget Sound. They were deployed for almost a year up there. And some companies might consider going up there because it's a smaller wave environment. They can test things at smaller scale. They don't have to worry about building a full scale device. It costs a little bit less. But essentially what we have here is there's two flaps. There's one in the front, one in the back. As the wave comes through, the wave would be coming from the direction we're looking at it. The, the, the flaps just move like arms, almost. Um, they move independently. Then you have two generators inside here that, as those arms are flapping, they're spinning those generators, creating electricity. And then also all electricity would be buried, would, would follow a cable, it would go from the device down into the ocean, buried subsea cable, and then onto shore and into a substation. That's generally how most of these offshore technologies work. This is a device called the, the Wet NZ device, and this was actually from a deployment last summer here in Oregon. Uh, it, was, it was put in the water in Toledo and then um, ferried out the river through Yaquina Bay, through Newport, and then to its final uh, test site, which was um, uh, just northwest of Newport, about three mile, two and a half miles offshore. It was deployed for about three months. It went out from, I think, July to end of September. It's a very successful deployment. It's actually the first successful deployment, retrieval, and test of a wave energy device in Oregon. So it's a very big moment for us. We we're very happy to see it. This device is actually half scale, so it would be twice the size of this. And this one was probably about 80 feet in length in there. And you'll see some more pictures. This was the, the day it was deployed. Oregon State and um, the Northwest National Marine Renewable Energy Center, which is a, a DOE, US Department of Energy funded research center at Oregon State for wave energy. Um, help design and build this device here. So this is called the Ocean Sentinel. It's a research platform. And this, the, the, wave, the wet NZ device was plugged in through a cable all underground, underwater, into this device. So we could see in real time, actually, uh, the energy that the device was producing. This dissipates the energy so it doesn't go electrocute the fish. Uh, so it puts the energy off. There's cameras on there so you can constantly see how the device is doing. Um, if anybody's tampering with it, things like that. Um, so the, like I said, this was deployed. This is what, what it looks like when it's in the water. We saw the last picture when it was being towed to site. So uh, that was a successful deployment. I got to go out to see and see it, and it was, uh, it was great to see something in Oregon's waters. This uh, is the attenuator device, like I showed you earlier. This is actually deployed in Orkney in Scotland as well. This is the, they call it the sea snake, the Palamus sea snake. Uh, another Scottish company who, uh, this technology's been around for quite a while. They've overcome a lot of the technological barriers as far as connecting to and from the grid. Um, but it's a very long device. This whole thing in length is probably 300, 400 feet long. And these tubes are probably 12 feet in diameter. It can, it can create a lot of electricity, but it takes a lot of um, steel and concrete and hydraulics and, and, and you know, just energy to go into it. So it's a, it's, a, it's a worthy technology. It works. Is it the one we'll see in the end? It's hard to say. I don't, we, we don't know which technology is going to win this race. This is the submerged, prefer, uh, submerged pressure differential device that we showed you earlier. This, would, so this is an Oregon company as well, M3 Wave Energy. They're based out of Salem. Uh, this device sits at the bottom of the ocean, completely out of sight, and preferably about 30 meters of water. As the waves pass over, there's airbags on each end of these chambers here, essentially. So the wave will come over and compress the air, push air through a pipe with a bidirectional turbine, and fill up a bag over here. When the wave hits this, it presses that bag back down, pushing the air back through that turbine. So you almost have a constant flow of energy as the waves are passing over. Really neat technology. I've seen it work uh, down at the wave tanks in, in Corvallis. Remember like I told you about the um, footprint of that other device, how one, one piece up here has a massive footprint under the sea? This, doesn't, this sits on the bottom, so it doesn't have the mooring systems that extend so far off from each angle. So you can fit, yeah, I'm making this up, you can fit 10 devices, of, 10 of these devices in the same footprint as you fit that other large device. This might be scaled, this might produce a little bit less electricity than another one, but when you can fit 10 in the same area, you're, you're kind of winning, you're doing better in that situation. And also, um, it's completely out of sight. We don't have, you don't have to worry about, um, well, one, hitting it with the boat at night. You don't have to worry about seeing it from the shore. Uh, it's a submerged technology. Of course, when I say hitting it with the boat, 
all this stuff will have Coast Guard approved lighting and, and uh, safety barriers set around it. But um, it's just, it's a huge advantage to this technology that sits on the bottom. This is a, a Danish company called Floating Power. This is a combo uh, wave energy slash wind. Um, they're developing this in, in um, Denmark. Uh, they're interested in Oregon. We're trying to get them here for more. Uh, to establish them here as well. This is a, it's a promising technology. I don't know as much about it as the others because they're not as uh, established here. This is uh, an example of a floating wind turbine. So you've probably heard a little bit about offshore wind recently too. The, it's been a big talk on the East Coast. Um, the East Coast has the advantage of having a fairly shallow continental shelf. So they can put projects, they can put wind turbines, they can build off of the bottom. In Oregon, our shelf drops off very quickly. It gets deep pretty quick here, so we can't have a 200-foot concrete structure holding up a wind turbine. It just wouldn't work. So we're, we're exploring what we have, this floating wind, and these platforms here, that's just a wind turbine. There's nothing different about that. But the platform is really where the technology is, and it's a, it's a constant shift and ballasting of water to making sure the platform stays really stable uh, as it's out at sea. And the advantage of offshore wind is, one is the, the wind technology is fairly well understood. Um, you can put these projects much further offshore at this point than you'd likely see wave energy projects because the cost of electricity for wind is much lower than what wave energy will likely be. Therefore, the cost of the project in general can afford to go a little bit further offshore. You can produce um, a lot of energy. There's, there's early stage talk of a project off of Coos Bay, which would be in conjunction with the Jordan Cove Natural Gas Export Facility. They did receive early money from the DOE to help establish the project. So we're hoping to see this. Oregon has a fantastic offshore wind resource, just like our waves. I've mentioned the Northwest National Marine Renewable Energy Center. I'll just fly through these real quick. I want to leave some time for questions. Um, this is at Oregon State. There's three research facilities around the country. One's in, uh, in Florida, and they study the Gulf Stream and how they can put energy devices out there. There's well, actually there's four now. Never mind. Um, there's one in Hawaii doing some wave energy research, and there's one at uh, the University of Washington focused on tidal as well. So, um, here at Oregon State, we have uh, the linear generator. I'll show you these pictures. One's a linear generator. Essentially, that's an up and down device. You can test things on there to see how it works. Uh, and then the wave tanks, there's two wave tanks at Oregon State. This is the large wave flume. Um, I don't know the exact um, diameters of it, but it's a large wave. You can put small scale devices in there and see how they react, and you can correlate the waves. You know, you know exactly what kind of wave systems you're getting. You can correlate that to the energy output, survivability of devices. This is the large wave tank. A lot of companies like to use this. You can deploy several devices, if you like, um, to see how the how they work as an array, because sometimes the energy, the energy will be taken out of certain devices as the wave passes through. So what's the best way to set your devices in the ocean when we start putting projects out there? What's the most strategic uh, layout for, for devices? Another picture of the deployment of the wet NZ device. Like I said, we were really happy for this deployment last summer, so we take a lot of pride in it. And then lastly, um, not lastly, but I'll, I'll fly through. The um, NIMRIC OSU is also working on developing a grid-connected test facility. I showed you that uh, floating research platform a few minutes ago where the power is dissipated. We're looking to um, build a grid-connected facility which will attract developers from around the world to come to Oregon and test their devices here. When you have grid connection, it, it, it is a little bit more desirable um, having that power go somewhere, possibly getting a very small return from the electricity you made. Some return in income is, is a very good thing for companies that are looking to do more R&D on their designs. This project should have four test berths, uh, four separate cables run into shore from each device. Uh, this will be located in Newport as well. Um, the reason for having four cables, you can plug each one in independently, and you can see specific power outputs from each device or array that's deployed. So this talks a little bit about the territorial sea plan, like I mentioned earlier. Um, essentially, how we worked with uh, all stakeholders to help identify areas for ocean energy development. Uh, I'll just I'll read I'll read you the summaries here, the things that um, that we're working with now after everything was said and done. 
uh, there's a 3% cap on actual footprint of ocean energy in the territorial sea. So territorial sea is X amount of square miles. Um, about 23 square miles are available for development. So that means that's about 3% of the larger territorial sea. So we don't want devices covering all of Oregon. There's select sites that I have another slide I'll show you here real quick. Um, seven years, the, the plan is reviewed to look for discrepancies and, and how we can uh, move forward with a new plan or update it if needs be. Um, spreads out ocean energy equally among three deep water ports. So the sites, as you'll see in a second, are um, spread from everywhere from Astoria down to uh, just north of Coos Bay. And the, the, main, the most important thing here is this is a highly precautionary approach. There's specific provisions for precautionary principle, adaptive management, and phase development. We're not just going to go throw 30 devices out in the ocean and hope for the best. We're starting small. We're going to start with projects, one or two buoys at a time. What's the effects of these things? How are they uh, producing? And, and we grow the industry and the projects from there. Like I said, a few maps here. Um, this shows this, these little red area, red and yellow areas show feasibility for wave energy devices. So what is the, the bottom types? What is the wave resource like? What is the access to a, a local substation, local grid points to connect? You can see the points in red are our best. Yellow, not as good, you know, they're going down the scale there. So essentially you can see these are the best places within Oregon's territorial sea. This doesn't include federal waters offshore. Then you lay on top of that all the other existing users of the ocean. The purple lines are shipping channels. Um, right there. There's mixed in here, this is, I'm not sure exactly what all these are, but there's, uh, there's marine reserves, there's prime fishing habitats, things like that. So you take all of those with the prime areas for development, and this is what you end up with for sites that were selected um, green light, the, the first sites that we'll see developed for ocean energy projects. This is on the south coast here, so we apologize that this is kind of backwards from how you usually look at the coast of Oregon, but uh, this is just off the lakeside just in between Coos Bay and Reedsport. This is just north of Reedsport, this site here. Uh, and then you have a very small site right here. This is southern Tillamook County off the um, near shore site just off of uh, Nestucca. And then up on the north end, north coast, this is Camp Rylea. Uh, Camp Rylea is a National Guard facility that is uh, very interested in developing renewables and uh, also interested in um, providing some ocean space and some infrastructure grid capabilities for projects to go in there. So. Like I said, the four sites were selected as primary sites. Everything here in yellow is what we'll just call secondary sites, sites that are potentially develop, able to be developed, but they're, you're going to go through a lot more of the precautionary permitting processes and things like that to develop these sites. They're a little more, um, uh, a little, they'll just be a little more difficult to, to develop. They're a little more sensitive to some of the environmental and other concerns. I think I'm getting towards the end. I apologize, I'm running a few minutes late. Um, just real quick, we don't need to go through all these, but these are all the permits and compliances that are necessary. This is for a project in state waters. These are the federal permits that would need to be gathered. You have to work with the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the Coast Guard. You have to do NEPA, Endangered Species, Marine Mammals, Fish Habitat, Migratory Birds. And then for state and local authorizations, these are the state and departments of state land, Department of Land Conservation, uh, State Department of Environmental Quality, Department of State Land. As you can see, the permitting, even in these approved sites, those four sites that were, that were uh, a win for the ocean energy industry, you're still going to have to go through all these permittings. We're, we're, we wanted this to be responsible and productive and make sure we're doing everything right and not hurting anything as we put projects into the water. And that's what this is um, going to ensure. I believe that's it. Happy to take questions for anybody. Again, my name is Matt Sanders, I'm Program Manager for Oregon Wave Energy Trust. I do have some cards up here as well. If anybody would like to take home some uh, cards, you feel free to email me or give me a call if you have any other questions, but happy to take some right now. Matt Quayler, form member. I'm curious about the economics of this. Is it, you know, what are the costs of these units? What's the payback period? Sure. And the other question I have is, uh, being in the ocean, it can be pretty caustic. 
on steel and whatnot. So what's the life expectancy of these units? Very good question. Uh, I'll start off with the, the economics question there for you. Um, the cost of these devices, like, like I said, these devices are all different, so we don't know exactly what the cost is. But likely, uh, early stage cost of this device is going to be upwards of five to six million dollars. And you know, um, these are these are these are prototypes. They're not mass produced at this point. As the industry grows, you start to see economies of scale coming in. Just like wind, where wind used to cost fifteen to twenty cents per kilowatt hour, now it's down to five or six, depending on the project. It's because you can produce wind turbines on a mass scale and really bring down the cost. Um, there's obviously a lot more cost to a project than just building the device. You need to lay cable out to your device to bring that power back to shore. Um, it's estimated that laying cable, ferry to sea cable, costs about a million dollars a mile. So that's why people are really interested to develop closer to shore as we're starting off here. Um, the, the cable ships would have to come from uh, possibly from Europe or Asia. There's, I don't think there's any cable ships on the West Coast of Micro. Anyway, it's an expensive venture to do that. Payback periods, there isn't one at this point. It would be beyond our life. But what makes this feasible is, just like other renewable energy industries, is uh, government subsidies that we're, we lobby for and we hope to have to help grow this industry. It's a new source of energy. Costs will come down over time, but currently, there's a payback period. There wouldn't be one for a wave energy project, uh, within our lifetimes at least. Your second question revolved around um, the harshness of the ocean and how that affects devices. That is, you know, I'd say the primary concern and focus of research right now for a lot of these devices. Um, people are starting to consider the use of concrete, that large uh, snake snake device. I know they've started experimenting with concrete and that says, how did you put concrete in the ocean? That doesn't make any sense. But there's a, in a hollow tube, whether it be concrete or steel, it's still going to have the ability to flow. So um, they're working hard. I think operations and maintenance is going to be a big part of this. So having a device that could be towed in every couple years to scrape off some of the biofouling and, and patch any holes uh, is, is going to be a good thing to have. And studying this, I saw that um, 28 million homes would be powered by just the Oregon coast if it, wave energy was really used. Mm -hmm. And yet, uh, you have a Reedport uh, wave farm that was supposed to be completed this spring. What's uh, happening with that? Good question. The 28 million homes, uh, I believe that comes from if we extracted all of the power from all of the waves that came onto Oregon, there would be enough energy to power 28 million homes. Um, like I said earlier, that's not feasible. That would, uh, I mean, what would that would do is it would it's make only three thousand three million people. Exactly. We're not gonna. We're not producing enough power. There is enough power in the ocean to power 28 million homes. That's not our goal. Our goal is to put projects out there to power coastal communities. Um, like I said, that would be extracting all the energy, and there wouldn't be any waves that ended up on your beach. We'd have a lake out there. You know, you can go water skiing on the ocean if that was the case. So, the 28 million is a is a, a number to say how much energy is available. Uh, what was your second question? Or did Reed I finish? Port. Your? Reedsport. The Reedsport project. The Reedsport uh, Wave Farm was a company called Ocean Power Technologies. That was the big yellow buoy that we, I showed you the picture of there. Um, they've run into some regulatory hurdles with the, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission as well as they've upgraded their design. So as of now, there currently is nothing out in Reedsport. Was it that the buoy you showed us? The one that was in the water? That was the wet NZ device that was deployed. So the, the, the Ocean Power Technologies is the one that was on the dock with the person. So it's built. It's sitting in Portland. You can probably go see it if you wanted, but it's it's not deployed yet, and unfortunately, it's been delayed now until 2016. So. Wow. Uh, would you say that's government interference with a semi-private? No. Uh, sorry. <laughs> I'll just finish that question by saying I can't speak for uh, Ocean Power Technologies. Um, it, they're a private company working to develop their own project. Uh, we were really hoping they'd get in this year. It was a big deal for us, too, and unfortunately they got held up. So, I'm Bill Kroger, a forum member. Thanks for coming today. Thank you.
I was uh, curious if you could tell us maybe a little bit about some of the specific concerns that environmentalists have regarding to marine life yeah. out there. You bet. Um, like I mentioned earlier, whales, everyone loves a whale. You know, you rarely see them, but you, you got to love them. Uh, they're mammals, they, they care for their young. Um, so whales are a big issue. Uh, we're concerned that they could get caught in the mooring systems. So devices like I showed you that don't have large mooring systems, devices that could use a single mooring, single point mooring. Um, anything to reduce those cables running through the water is very helpful. Um, the benthic habitat, how's this going to affect crabs? How's it going to affect fish? Um, fishermen are concerned that they're, you know, they're not going to be able to fish in as many places. We tend to think that these are going to essentially serve as marine reserves where fish can go. There's already marine reserves off of our coast as well where you can't fish. So you're providing um, areas where fish can uh, nurse and be safe and hopefully expand their populations. Helps the fisheries. Uh, other concerns are sediment transport, like I've been saying. Um, a wave energy device takes the energy out of the wave. And the waves are what move our sand. They've helped form our beaches and they've exposed all of our great rocks on our Oregon coast. So if we're starting to take energy out of those waves, how's that going to affect our beaches? How's that going to affect where we can um, you know, launch our boats from in, in, in uh, the Pacific City? Quick answer to that, you know, what I like to think is if we lined our ocean three miles offshore with devices, one right next to each other, and we took all the energy out of that, that's a very good possibility we would affect our sediment transport. But these are going to be small, you know, relatively small projects in an area that the waves are going to be coming from different angles at all the time. Um, you're not going to be extracting all the energy. The technology isn't there. We don't extract all the energy from wind. Um, so you're still going to have some movement of your sediment. Answer your question? Good. Thank you for coming today. Um, one of the, Jerry Arnold member, uh, one of the questions I had is that as I look at the wind farms um, down in the Columbia River Gorge, there has to be some sort of a return on investment, and they've gathered them pretty close together. I was just curious, how many of these devices would be, say, in a square mile or in a typical wind farm, or how many would, how many do you think there would be? Again, I'll have to defer to uh, the fact that all these technologies are a little different. Um, in the actual footprint, I don't think people haven't released all that information yet. It depends on the depth of where you're at as well. The deeper you go, the longer your mooring lines are going to have to express or extend. Um, essentially, they're not going to be, most technologies like the ocean power technology buoy, um, they're not going to be right next to each other. There will probably be uh, one per acre or two, you know, roughly, that's kind of how I picture it. I don't think we know for sure yet until we actually know exact project locations and, and depths and topography, uh, bathymetry and things like that. But other technologies will be a little more densely packed. Ones that might use a single point mooring or the one that sits on the bottom, you can fit. Those, you, you're going to want to minimize your impact as little as you can. John McWilliams, uh, member, um, I'm well, you know, we're very fortunate that we have NOAA um, here at Newport. Um, obviously, they're working with the water. Um, do you have anything that you work with them on, or do they have any rules that you have to follow, or how does that work? Do you have any relationship with NOAA? We, um, I can't say we have a, a working relationship with NOAA. We obviously work with them. Um, we will defer to them on issues with fisheries and climate and uh, wave. So NOAA actually maintains all of the wave buoys, so we can know what type of waves are coming. Like I said, 72 hours, and you know, there's ones that are 100 miles offshore, there's ones that are five miles offshore. So they maintain all the buoys. I think our relationship will grow with them, uh, especially on the, the buoy maintenance part, because the more buoys we have, the more predictable, uh, the better we're gonna be able to see the resource coming on shore. So that's one area that we work with NOAA. Uh, they've been involved in some of the fishery reports and things that we've worked with as well. Um, them coming to Newport was a, was a big advantage for Newport. Uh, Newport also won the Pacific Marine Energy Center, like I showed you earlier, and another big win. Newport's really setting up to be a, you know, a research um, educational hub along the Oregon coast. And, uh, they have the, uh, the aquarium there, and they have the Hatfield Marine Science Center, and, and NOAA, and a very strong fishing fleet, and then um, the PMEC as well. So. Go ahead. Uh, Lee Hunt, former member. Uh, I wonder if 
you have any assessment of what a good sized tsunami or earthquake would do to some of these sure. devices? <clears throat> Again, um, hard to say exactly. Uh, we hope that that doesn't happen. But as they're developing their technologies, just like you develop a wind turbine to have shutdowns, um, so that the you know when they do wind turbines close, shut down quite often when the winds get too strong in the gorge. So you you build in a fail safe. The technologies are doing the same thing. Let me just show you one example. Um, excuse me. This technology here, Columbia Power Technologies, you see those red knobs on there? That, this was an earlier, earlier stage of their technology. So the waves are pushing those devices up. You get a big enough wave, it's going to be hitting against those red knobs. You don't want that. That's a breaking point. And they realize this. So what they've done with their technology is they've removed that completely, and the, the arms are independent, and they can, if a big wave comes through, it's just going to push that device all the way over so it doesn't break it doesn't fall apart, and then they've built in an internal ratchet system to bring it back to function. Um, tsunamis often are uh, not as big far out at sea. The wave isn't quite as big. They really gain a lot of their height as they come into the shallower depths and all that water is pushed up. Um, so the further offshore projects, I don't want to say it won't be affected, but the, the likelihood of them being destroyed by a tsunami is a little bit less. Hi, I'm a member. I'm concerned about the legality of the ownership of the floor of the ocean. Apparently, Oregon's claiming a three-mile limit that we're in charge of, and the feds go deeper. I'm not sure how much further. But what's to stop a private owner from going beyond the three miles and claiming 200 miles of ocean floor sure. and putting their own devices there? And secondarily, on the same issue, What's to stop somebody like North Korea from hooking up to one of these puppies and taking it home with them? And, 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 and taking a lot of technology with them. Uh, I'll do my best to answer your question. Um, so the, the ocean floor is owned by the people of the United States, the people of Oregon for three miles, and the people of the United States beyond that. Um, well, just like, not to Japan. Not to Japan. So there is a, there is a cutoff for... Um, the federal waters, I believe it's 200? in the range of 100 and 150 miles. Okay. Um, so anyone who is interested in putting a project further out to sea than that is going to spend a lot of money to do that, and it's not going to be a profitable project. I wouldn't expect to see that. It's, uh, like I said, a million dollars a mile to lay that cable. Um, so the chances of people taking advantage of free leasing space, they're paying a lot more on the other end for it. Uh, what and then uh, like pirates. the pirates? Um, so technology these days, I, you know, I have a feeling that there's going to be cameras on most everyone. There's there's GPS locator units. They're connected not just to the mooring, but they're connected to the grid. Um, and any time that uh, someone would come into the area and, and take a device, first off, they'd be noticed really quick for being suspicious. It would take them several hours, if not days, to disconnect from the from the cable and to disconnect the moorings and pull it across. So if they were able to do that in sea states, you know, rough seas that didn't allow someone from shore to get out, then uh, more power to them. <laughs> yeah. That's a good question. Should we hurry, Booty, and pull out the Yeah, we should. Questions. You know, I spent some time at the beach and I rarely see ocean going ships unless you're real close to the mouth of the Columbia River. Are the shipping lanes farther out primarily? In other, what's, the, what's the chance of a uh, freighter or even a smaller fishing boat or sailboat going up and down the coast from getting tangled up in all this stuff? It's a good question. Um, I, so, this, this image on the screen now. Um, shows you the shipping lanes. They're in purple, the purple shaded. It's really, it's pretty hard to see. And I don't know exactly the scale of, of what those are, the miles. Um, so as you can see, this is a shipping lane likely coming out of, that's probably Newport, possibly? Depot Bay. Depot Bay, probably, somewhere in that central coast. Um, so they stick fairly close to the areas that they're supposed to be in. And then out here is the north-south line, essentially, that they'll be going. For, for scale, this, all these colors 
are three miles. So you add, you know, you multiply that times how many times. We're looking at 30 miles offshore for the larger freighters probably that are run through. As far as fishing boats, they do use these areas and it's, you know, we've run into some conflict with some of the fishing communities because as we propose sites that we want to fish, then um, these are sites that they've been fishing as well. So as we're responsibly developing this, we're trying to work with fishermen to identify the best locations to put ocean projects. Um, we understand there's going to be some overlay and there's going to be conflict, but we do our best to minimize that. And then, um, you know, buoys will be um, illuminated, we'll have Coast Guard approved lighting and reflectors and there will be uh, separate buoy markers as you come into an area warning you that there's electricity conversion devices in the water and you should be able to see them. So. Chris, let's leave point members still. The idea of uh, research and development, uh, the Oregon Wave Energy Trust is supported by the lottery, isn't it? Yes, sir. Uh, and could you give us an idea of how many or how much the funds are available to you? And what is there any payoff? Do we get anything in return other than research and development? And a lot of, uh, well, shall we say, good talk? <laughs> good question. Um, so like, he, like uh, he mentioned, we are funded through, we're actually funded through the Oregon Innovation Council, which is funded through a portion of state lottery dollars. Good portion goes to education and then um, gets dispersed through our government. Then the Oregon Innovation Council, which is uh, our funder, they also fund other initiatives like uh, Oregon uh, Best, Oregon Drive, which are um, also groups that are looking to establish new clean tech industries here in Oregon. So the state is essentially investing in us. Um, to help create industry and so the return is that we have an industry and we have jobs and we have um, the ability to export and people are buying wave energy devices here they're buying our uh, our research that we've done um, some numbers for you or OET Oregon Wave Energy Trust has received 12 million dollars in funding since uh, 2007 when we were created we get renewed every two years um, we're on a biennium schedule we just got renewed um, couple months ago for the 2013 to 15 biennium and we got another two million dollars and the thinking here is that you, you start off with a higher number and you get less less every couple years because the money that you've had to work with is helping to establish industry so by the end hopefully everything can run on its own in the time being we're doing the best that we can to strategically use the money that the state gives us to identify uh, where research needs to go into and, and to make sure that we spend that as wisely to help grow the industry what other states are doing research besides Oregon? In wave energy, um, they're, you've seen a little bit out of Maine. I just talked with someone from Maine last evening. They're also really focused on tidal up there. Uh, there's a little bit going on in uh, New Hampshire, the University of New Hampshire. Apparently there's a very small coast in New Hampshire. I didn't know this. <laughs> they do have a little bit of coastline. So University of New Hampshire has a, a very small, uh, they have an ability to put devices in the ocean, but the wave climate there is uh, not very exciting for developers. Some people have been going there, but um, you know it's not as beneficial to build and deploy devices there because you're not going to get as good data from it. Uh, the University of Washington is focused on tidal energy. Um, the uh, I think it's the University of Hawaii. I'm not positive, but they're doing some wave energy research as well. Really, Oregon is the leader, and especially Oregon State, as far as research from a university level that's going into wave energy. Uh, Oregon State is a, is a prime leader and well recognized in the industry. Questions? Thank you all for your questions. Very good. Questions. I think Matt did a great job, and uh, I hope we can have him back in the future because that was a great presentation. Uh, next forum, it's very likely we're going to have someone from Washington County's Property uh, and Tax Assessment Division coming out to speak with us. We'll have complimentary pitchforks and torches for all four <laughs> members. And, um, uh, a, a nominal fee to ignite the torches. With that being said, I'd like to uh, remind you once again to tip if your service was great. And uh, a couple quick reminders. Uh, it looks like we're going to have an awkward program to address uh, a need from the governor on the 30th of this month. We have on the schedule Ted Wheeler, the Oregon treasurer. However, if the governor calls a special session, in that instance, we've got Katie Riley who will speak in Ted Wheeler's absence. 
So if you don't understand how we've laid this out in print, I wanted to explain that to you. Also, uh, on the 7th, we have Secretary of State Kate Brown coming out. And so to have two statewide electeds in succession coming out, I think, is a, a great uh, bit of programming. I want to thank our program committee, uh, who's uh, uh, two-thirds of which are here today, uh, John and Ted, and also Kathy in absentia. That being said, I'd like to conclude today's forum program, and thank you for being here.